G'day home brewers, thanks for tuning in. My name's Jeff and this is 15 Minutes in the Brewery. And today I'm gonna to be talking about Red Ale and my version two Red Ale, which I have right here. I poured that about seven or eight minutes ago. Um, and as you can see, the head's dissipated. I poured it seven or eight minutes ago because I wanted to kind of try and bring it up to a little bit of temperature so I could give it a fair rating for you guys on YouTube and let you know how my version two went. And spoiler alert, it's still a work in progress. Um, but I think I'm learning, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm a slow learner. Um, I've done 101 batches of beer now, but I'm a bit of a slow learner. And I don't know, I just like to fiddle with things. And by fiddling thing, with fiddling with things a lot, um, you tend to, you know, make mistakes quite a lot. Um, I'm, not, I'm not the kind of person to follow recipes and just buy recipe kits and do them and, and make them. And if I did that, I'd probably get better beer most, a lot of the time, especially in the earlier days, the earlier years of my home brewing adventures. But uh, I don't know, I like to do crazy things like saving yeast and um, experimenting with different hops and yeast and malts and, and things like that, you know. So, and when you experiment a lot, you're going to break, you know, you're going to break some things when you, when you do it. What's that saying? What's that saying where you break something? Um, oh, you can't break, you can't make an omelette without breaking a few eggs, right? So you're going to break some eggs and this is not a broken egg, don't get me wrong, but it's a work in progress. Now, what I've learned from this beer is I, I just go too low on my mash temperatures a lot of the time. Um, I don't know, I have this obsession with fermentability and just wanting things to be more fermentable. But I, I don't know, it's taken me a long time to realize, but I don't, sorry, pref preface a little bit. I, I do, or have in the past brewed a lot of lagers and a lot of drier pale ales that I tried to get dry. So I would mash a bit lower in, in, um, and to bring those um, gravities down, the final gravity down a bit and to get it a little bit drier finish. Um, but I kind of did that with my red ale and I've kind of realized it's not the right thing to be doing. I shouldn't be mashing too low and I shouldn't be creating a super fermentable wort uh, making a red ale. You want residual sugars in your beer. You want a bit of residual sweetness. Now, and how that ties into this beer is um, I fermented this with Lalamond Nottingham yeast and it just went too dry. It dropped down to 1010, which I think is just too low for this style. So I've lost a fair chunk of the residual sweetness in this beer. So, and it's quite dry. Um, and th that'd be okay if I dry hopped it with a, I don't know, Amarillo or something. And it could be like a really nice amber ale. That'd be, it'd be a great beer if it was, if it was, had a big dry hop. Because it didn't have a huge dry hop and it's only 24 IBUs, I believe this one was 24, this version. Um, it's kind of relying on that malty sweetness to really um, bring the uh, the mouthfeel and, and the flavor to the beer, right? Yeah, and because it's gone a bit dry, it's gone, it's not too thin, but it's just the flavor, it, just the, the sweetness is really fermented out mostly. Now there's still sweetness there, it's just a lot more subtle. And the uh, this one has only got medium crystal in it. Actually, I'll read the recipe out really quickly before I waffle too much. It only had medium crystal in it, this recipe. I actually do like the medium crystal. I was experimenting to find out what the different crystals were like, mixing them together and then trying them separately to see what they were like. Because the English crystal, English crystals, I can't say it properly. So they're English crystals, um, which kind of suit these styles of beer, I guess. Um, yeah, so 7% medium crystal from Crisp. That's 240, Crisp 240 crystal. 1.3% um, roasted barley. 10% uh, Voodoo Schooner malt, because I still had Voodoo Schooner left. Voodoo Schooner is probably the, not the right malt to be putting in this beer, to be honest. I don't think it really works well with a red ale. And in my next beer, uh, my next iteration is gonna have Cara Red. I'm getting low on the voodoo anyway, um, and I'll probably switch over to Cara Red. And eventually, I'm going to go back to um, the Gladfield malts. Uh, Gladfield's got two Redback and Shepherd's Delight kind of work well together. And I'm probably going to go back to like a maybe a, a Redback malt, something like that. I think long term, I'll try the Cara Red first and see how it goes. So I picked up some Cara Red, um, which is primarily I want to do um, a kind of an amber lager with it. So. But I might try a bit of Cara Red in my next version. 
and see how that stands up against the Voodoo Schooner, see how it, what the differences are. Uh, and 81.8% of finest Halal Marisotta. And you kind of lose the Marisotta in this beer, unfortunately. I mean, I get the nuttiness. You do get that nuttiness in the background. And you do get that, um, the medium crystal does come through a little bit, but I, like I said, a lot of that sweetness, I think has probably been fermented out too much by the Nottingham, which just, just went too low. And maybe Nottingham's the wrong yeast for this beer as well. Um, it just, yeah, it just really went to town on it. And I think it probably next time I'll probably do uh, SO4. Um, I think SO4 might be a better choice um, for this particular beer. What was my original? So my original was 1041 and it finished at 1010 for 4.1%. Um, so I need to get my original probably up to 1044. And I need to get my final gravity around 1013, 1014 probably, maybe. Um, and get a little bit of residual malt, a little bit of residual dextrins and a little bit of residual sweetness. And I think this that would greatly improve this beer. It's just too dry. And because of it's gone so low, the um, um, the the uh, roasted barley that I put in, which is only 1.3%, I think I said, um, you can really you can really tell the roasted barley's there. And it's not really a high percentage. It's just really being accentuated by the um, um, by the dryness, unfortunately. So my next iteration's already uh, planned for this one. Um, and the recipe looks like this. I'll tell you what the recipe's like. There it is there. So the recipe is 77% uh, Marisotta, 10% Cara Red, 6% extra light crystal, I'm going the extra light this time, and 6% medium. So I'm going to skip the, the crystal 150, I'm going to go crystal 100 and crystal 240. Um, and hopefully with the crystal 100, that will just give it a little bit more sweetness. And I've dropped the roasted barley down to 0.7%. I've also dropped the color down a little bit to 15.5. This one I think was 17 from memory. It's quite dark for a red ale, but I don't, I don't mind darker red ales. And the last change is I've gone for, for SO4. I've got a packet of SO4, and I'm going to use SO4. So hopefully, SO4 will produce just a little bit less dry beer. Um, there's a colour, if you can see. I'll get my hands out of the way. That would help. So that's what it looks like. If you can see that. Hopefully, you can see that quite well. Let me see if I can... Oh, yeah. It's kind of a little bit amber red. It's not true red. I kind of want to get to true red eventually. Like I said, I think in earlier videos, this will be a house beer um, and it'll be on fairly regularly. And I want to get a nitro set up. Um, eventually I want to get a nitro set up and I want to have a nitro tap and always have either a red ale or a stout on nitro, especially red. Red ale on uh, nitro is just delicious. And, and the best red ale I ever had was by Batch Brewing in Sydney and it was on nitro and it was so good it was just delicious really really nice um yeah it's just perfect it was so yeah anyway that's how it's going at the moment with this beer like i said still a work in progress so hopefully eventually i'll get a recipe that i'll i'll share and you can and if you want to brew a red ale like that you'll be able to brew something that I've brewed. But I wouldn't brew it to this style yet, so, or to this particular recipe. Now, the one thing I wanna hone in on is the mash temperature. Now, I alluded to that before, I like to, well, the kind of beers that I've made mostly, I, I go for maximum fermentability, so I ferment at, sorry, I mash at uh, 65 Celsius um, with the digi ball which means that it often drops to 64 and then it'll heat back up to 65. It just gets to 66, cuts out, it stays there for a few couple of minutes and then it drops back to 65, then back to 64. Then as soon as it drops below 64, it'll start heating again. So it's not super accurate. So it is going quite low. Um, with the next recipe, I'll be mashing at 68 Celsius. So I'm gonna set it at 68. Maybe 69, I might go 69, because that'll mean it'll drop as low as 67 as it heats up again. But it'll hit 70. Uh, uh, 
uh, so it might be, oh no, so it might be okay. I think 68, so if I do 68, what will happen is while it's mashing, it'll drop to 67, then it'll drop to 66 and the heat element will kick back in and it'll heat back up and then it'll go to 68 and it'll just, it'll get to 69 and then it will cut out. It won't go to 70, that never goes beyond 16, it never goes beyond a degree above the temperature. Now, I can't vouch for how accurate the measurement is from that thermometer at the bottom. I just can't, I can't vouch for that. I can only tell you what I see on the on the on the gauge, right? So I, you just got to work with that. Um, you can't get stuck in the weeds with with worrying about oh, you know, where's the temperature in the mash? Should I be measuring here, 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 here? Like that's a rabbit hole. You just I don't I don't want to go down that rabbit hole at this time in my life. I'm quite happy for the, um, the 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 mild inaccuracies of this particular setup. Doesn't really bother me too much. And you know, honestly, if I wanted to get a more accurate mash ton, I would probably just get a cooler. To be pretty honest, I'd probably just get a cooler mash tun. Those things will hold half a degree Celsius for about 35, 40 minutes. They're great. They're really good. Really, really, really um, stable at holding, like a good at holding a stable temperature, is what I was trying to say. Yeah, so there you go. I'm gonna leave it there. It's not a really long video today. I just want to talk about that. Um, I, I brewed a breakfast out a while ago. That's already gone. I finished that. I. Just, I just I liked it. I drank a lot of it, obviously, and it's gone. Um, I brewed a, a, a version two of the Coffee Dark Mild. There's still there's still some in the keg in the fridge, but there's an issue with that, and I'm going to talk about that in a separate video. Just a mystery issue with that particular beer. Um, yeah, really, really odd. Um, considering how good the no, the first one was quite good. The second version I thought was just because I just amped up the same recipe. I just amped it up a little bit for the second version, so I thought, oh, it's going to be even better. Um, but I had a clarity issue. It's really odd. It's, um, I don't know what happened, but I think it might be pH related. Um, um, but it, it, it's cloudy. It's hazy as hazy as mud. And it's been 45, 50 days in the keg now, and it is still mud. It's just mud. Um, and I'll do a video about that soon just to talk about it because I can't remember the last time I had a beer that was like mud. And I'm not sure what went wrong. It tastes okay, except it does taste, um, it tastes, you know like what beer tastes like before it drops clear and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, it's, when, it, when, a, when a beer is, is supposed to be clear and it's still a little bit hazy because you've just kegged it, you drink it, you're like, yeah, it tastes good, but I can kind of taste the, the residual haziness, that, the, the stuff that's in that, the proteins or whatever it is, you can taste that and it kind of clouds the flavor a bit. And then when it drops clear, suddenly you're like, oh, that tastes so much better. It tastes fresher and clearer and cleaner. Well, that's what that's kind of like, not clean, the muddy side, obviously. So it's like that perpetually. It's got good flavor, but it's like it's perpetually just muddy because of whatever it is in the beer that just won't drop out. So uh, maybe I should try um, before I tip the keg, because I might actually just tip the keg, to be honest, uh, and move on with it. I've got other beers I want to brew, so. Uh, but if I don't, I might try a bit of gelatin. Um, I've never, I never really used gelatin much. I used it once and I blocked up my dip tube, so that's how good I am at using gelatin. I might, who knows, but anyway. So that's the Red Ale. Um, that one's, yeah, not that good. Sorry, the, the Dark Mile, not that great. Um, the Stout's gone. I have a, a uh, like a New Zealand Pilsner, I guess, in the in the other keg at the moment. That's quite nice. Melba Hops, um, just a basic Pilsner with Melba Hops. That's actually tasting pretty good. I did that with S23. It's a little bit fruity, a little bit, not too much. Um, quite a nice beer. And I've got an IPA in the uh, fermenting fridge at the moment um, with a lot of hops in it. And I'm just waiting for it to pass its um, VDK, the diacetyl test. I did a forced diacetyl test today, day three of dry hop, and it came back positive. You could, as soon as I opened the bottle and had a smell, it smelled nice and fruity, but then when I gave the bottle a bit of a stir, bang, you could just smell butter, butter. Not, not too strong though, it actually wasn't that bad, but the butter's there and I can smell it. So maybe I'm just really sensitive to diacetyl, but I could smell it. So um, probably a little bit of hop creep in that one, um, which does happen. Just a lot of people can't really detect diacetyl all that well, so they'd probably never tell that they've got hop creep. But just a little bit of hop creep, and I know that also the, the pressure on that actually rose a couple of PSI after I dry hopped, so that is indicative of some um, uh, some enzymatic action going on and a little bit of extra re-fermentation going on. So, um, so yeah, so hopefully that 
clears up in the next day or two, the diacetyl, um, and I can start cold crushing that and keg it and do a video about that one as well. So, uh, but apart from that, I've got, I've got this bottle here, which I'm gonna be doing a video on, on in a minute. I'm just actually letting that sit out the moment to come up to kind of cellar temperature, like more about 10 degrees Celsius, so I can do it justice. But apart from that, that's it. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I hope you got something out of this video. Uh, if anything, persevere. Um, when you're brewing to a certain style, there's so many things you gotta think about, not just recipe, but also your process, and specifically like mass temperature. Um, and yeast selection and how that's gonna what that's gonna produce as far as fermentation results and how that's gonna affect your beer in the end and whether that's gonna keep that beer to style or not. It's keeping a reasonable little cap on top, it's not too bad. Um, so for me, SO4 next time, higher mash temperature, a little bit of extra residual sweetness, and I reckon version free will be heaps better. And if it's not, if version free is not a, a, a great improvement over this, then I'm just gonna give up brewing. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> just start buying beer again. No, I won't give up brewing. Can't give up brewing. Anyway, that's it. Thanks, thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you got something out of it, like I said, about three times now. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers. Bye.